Good morning. That's nice and loud and bright. <laughs> you should be awake now. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. Welcome to worship at Pioneer today. It's a nice sunshiny day in Southwest Michigan. It's lovely to have you worshiping with us. I'm going to invite you to just say a nice word of welcome to someone next to you. Maybe the person you came with, maybe someone you've never seen before. Just say a nice word of welcome to someone close by. Amen. All right. Welcome to the place where we learn more about Jesus and we learn to be faithful disciples. So if you're worshiping up with us here in the sanctuary or if you're joining us online, we are happy to have you today. I'm going to invite you to turn your attention to the screens for the Pioneer Pulse. I'm Brianna Martin, the Grow Groups Coordinator at Pioneer. Summer Grow Groups are open for registration. We have some wonderful groups returning as well as new groups, including a multicultural vegetarian cooking group. You don't have to be local to Pioneer to join a Grow Group. Many of our groups are offered online, which means you can join us from anywhere in the world. Are you excited yet? Good. To check out the options and join a Grow Group, you can go to our website, pmchurch.org slash grow and click the button that says join a group or you can text the word join to 269-281-2345. When you do that, we'll text you back with a link to our listing and you can choose a group that fits your interests and schedule. Being part of a grow group can help you share your passion, make new friends and grow in your faith. I hope you'll join us today. The Pioneer Media Team is hiring. <laughs> well, we actually, we aren't hiring, but we are looking for volunteers. We're always looking for people to help. At the moment, we're especially looking for people to run sound, but we're also looking for people to run camera and help in the video control. If you have prior experience, that's great, but it isn't required as we will provide training. The key things are your willingness to serve and to learn. To sign up, please email media at pmchurch.org or fill out the form at pmchurch.org slash media team. Hope to hear from you soon. Hello, church family. Did you know that PMC Evergreens has nearly 100 kids and is one of the largest clubs in Michigan? Pathfinders allows kids from all sorts of homes to learn from an Adventist curriculum. With our teachers, we learn how to study our Bible, show God's love to our community, and we have fun earning honors too. I want to ask something special of you. A club this size needs your support. Next year, we are planning on going on an international camporee to Gillette, Wyoming. And we're hoping that every kid who wants to go will be able to. But that will only be possible with your help. Give an offering online or in person to the line item Pathfinder Camporee. Thank you for all you do for us kids. Right, so I hope you've taken a note of those and that you will participate as you are able. And now we're going to turn to the call to worship. It's in your worship bulletin or it will be on the screen. There's not one of us here today who would deny that this, these are interesting days in which we live. There's so much going on around us, near and far away. And our call to worship this morning is asking us to engage with this change in a particular way. And so we are encouraged to find refuge and security in the ways of God. We commit ourselves to God and wait patiently for God's timing to unfold. Do not be swayed. Do not be tempted. Do not succumb to lesser ideals. We look to God's ways and desire only God's plan for good. Amen. Let's pray. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, 
with change and decay all around us, we worship you, the God who does not change. We thank you this morning that you have brought us into your house of worship, this house of prayer for all peoples of all nations, of all language and tongue and description. As our names and our faces and our languages differ, so do our needs, so do the things that we desire, so do the things that distract us. And so we surrender ourselves before you this morning and ask that you will help us to wait for your timing to unfold and ask that you will help us to desire only your plan for good. So teach us this morning how to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hello church, welcome and happy Sabbath. We are so excited to be here with all of you as we are going to worship today. So I actually am going to invite you all to stand with us as we sing our first song, invite you to worship, and we are just happy to be here. <laughs> Trembles at it. 
now as we sing our next song, it is going to be our hymn before our prayer. So if you have any prayer requests or praises that you want to leave at the foot of the cross, I invite you to come down um, as we're singing our short song, just to come here to the front of the room. those who are able to kneel, please kneel. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Prince of Peace, our Creator and Redeemer, thank you for bringing each person here today in your house or online. Thank you for drawing us with your tender mercies and loving kindness. You are here and dwelling with us. You say in your word, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Please forgive us as we may not have loved you or others if you have asked us, have not followed your commands or lack faith to do as you've asked us. Thank you for your promise that you say if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We claim your promise that you will give us a new heart and put a new spirit in us and that you will remove from us our hearts of stone and give us a heart of flesh. We lift up Savka Markovich and family for the loss of her husband, Marjan Markovich, May your Holy Spirit give them your peace that passes all understanding and comfort them. May you give them hope that they will see their father on their resurrection day. Many of us have burdens. We humbly cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And we pause for a moment to give them to you. May you touch each heart today and bring healing to us. 
Please be with Pastor Prescott as he opens the word of God to us. May your Holy Spirit anoint his mind, heart, and lips. May our hearts be softened and subdued with that we may hear and accept the message you've given to him. May the peace of Jesus reign in our hearts, and may we honor and glorify you in all that we do and say in this worship service. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Isn't it wonderful to know we have a beautiful Savior? And that he loves all his children and that you are one of them and so am I. It's, it's good to be loved by Jesus. And so now it's time for our littler children, the littler children of Jesus to come forward for their story, to hear what Jesus has to say to them through our storyteller today who is Trudean. So now Trudean is going to tell us a story after young people, after our children walk down the aisles and collect the offering for Christian education. So while the song is being played, I'm going to invite all the children to collect all the offering on the outer aisles, on the inner aisles, and bring them forward to the church. And we will put them all together in support of Christian education. So children, it's your turn. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. You're looking so lovely. Can I tell you? Look like you're ready for an amazing summer. Are you, re are you ready for an amazing summer? Yeah. School is out and you're just ready to frolic and have a good time, right? Awesome, awesome. So, do you know what this is? Bread. What is it? Bread. Well, do you, have you ever heard of the story about bread coming from heaven? Have you heard about that? If you haven't heard about the one called manna, ask your parents to tell you about the story because it literally fell from the sky. I'm going to tell you another story, though, about bread that Jesus gave. Do you know that there are some children who have to pray for this? Did you know that? It's not that easy to come by for some people. So I'm going to tell you a story, just a little story about that. 
Now, I learned this story when I was a little girl. And it's from the uncle author, Bedtime Stories. And a lot of those stories kept me as I was growing up. So I'm going to tell you this one. So there's a family of five. There's a mommy, there's a daddy. There are three children. Now, the father was very sick. Very, very sick. How do you look when you're sick? Wow. Right, you did a very good job. Very sick. And he lost his job because he was very sick. So he couldn't work. Well, months passed. Now father said to his wife, Mom, I don't know if we're going to make it. I don't think we're going to make it. And she said, well, God has to do something for us. And he says, man, he has to do something soon. And mom said, I'm very concerned about the children. There's not a bite to eat in the house. Everywhere there's no food. So father said, you mean to tell me the last bit of bread is done? She said, yes, it's all done. As they were speaking, guess what happened? In bolted the children. One, two, three. Mommy, 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 I'm hungry. What well, do you know how you are when you come from school? Straight into the kitchen. You want to know what's in the fridge, what's here to eat. He's shaking his head, like, yep, that's how it goes. Right? And you're just very hungry. You want to find something to eat. So, like, mom, mom, what can I eat? Mom said, you know, I'm afraid God hasn't sent that yet. So the little one, he held on his head and he was very sad. And he said, Mommy, so if there's nothing to eat, why don't we just ask Jesus to send us something to eat? Oh, we got to be like little children. And he will bring us some. So Father said, brilliant idea. Let's go. Immediately, everybody gathered around the table, the empty table. They bowed down. And guess what they started to do? Pray. They started to pray. Now, while they were praying... There were some people, two ladies from their church, sitting down wondering, what's going on with these, this family? I haven't seen them around. Something must be going on. And the other lady said, I think, you know, because he lost his job and he hasn't been around, so maybe something is going on with the family. So the other lady said, okay, let's go visit them. So off the two ladies went. And as they were going up the steep hill to their house, there comes this vehicle. The vehicle is a bakery truck. And just as the ladies were going up the brow of the hill, the truck boom, passed them. And just as he was passing them, guess what happened? He hit a stone, the back of the van flew open, and out came a loaf of bread. <laughs> and they were like, okay. What? But before they could even think about it, guess what happened again? He continued driving so fast. He's just going up the bumpy hill like this, and guess what happened? Bread, bread, bread. Everything was falling out. Just bread, bread. Lots of bread. It was a true story. And the ladies are looking there like, what are we going to do with all this bread? Bread is everywhere. And they said, if we don't pick them up, the coming traffic will just squish them all. So the ladies bent down, and they picked up bread, and they picked up bread on this side, and they picked up bread on the other side, and then they stood on the side of the road saying, what are we going to do with all this bread? We can't even catch him. We don't know whose it is. We can't return it. So guess what they did? They said, we will take it with us, and let's see what happens. And that's what they did. They got to the house of the people that were praying. What were they praying for? And when the lady knocked on the door, the mother got up and she opened the door. When she opened the door, there stood two ladies with their hands full of loaves of bread. And the ladies, when they saw behind mom and looked, guess what they saw? They saw people praying, the father and the three children, praying around the table with nothing on it, an empty table. They were so blessed. And a little boy jumped up and say, the one, that, the one that said, let's pray, he jumped up and said, see, I know what Jesus brought. He brought bread. I knew he would give us something to eat. So this story is to remind all of you to pray always. Uh, okay, so clasp your hands like this. This is pray always. Can you do that? Pray 
always. Make a circle. Pray always. Now, anytime you see a loaf of bread, remember this story. And it doesn't matter what it is, children, that you want. God said in Isaiah 65, verse 24, while you, before you call, he answers. And while you're speaking, he is hearing. All right. Do we have, oh, I saw a hand. All right, come. We have someone that's going to pray for us. We're going to close our eyes. Now remember, we're going to pray and we're going to thank Jesus for blessings and to help to ask Jesus to give us faith. Okay? All right, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Dear God, Dear God, please welcome everyone at PMC. Please let everyone be safe over here. Please don't let no more accidents, and please let no, no more people dying, and please let people be safe from death. Keep them to Jesus. In the Lord's time, right? amen. 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 Happy Sabbath. Go back to your seats. Thank you.
So for today, our scripture reading is going to be found in Psalms 33, verses 20 to 22. And it says, we, hate, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I find these verses so beautiful because I think that in today's day and age, it's so easy to get overwhelmed and stressed out and anxious about so many things that are not in our control. And I think that that's why it's so beautiful that as Christians, we carry this peace and this joy and this hope and all this love and this confidence knowing that we trust somebody that's so much greater than ourselves, and that he's above us and he's above our plans and he's above our will and our ways. And that's what makes it so beautiful having this faith in God. And as Christians, we're here with smiles on our face and we have this confident trust that God knows exactly what he's doing, even in times that it seems as though all hope is lost and all confidence is gone. God knows exactly what he's doing because he's above us and he loves us so much. So please sing with us above all. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all
Thank you to our praise team, and thank you to our media team for setting things up today. Thank you so much for that. Pioneer, it's good to see each one of you. It's good to see each one of you, and it's good because I get to welcome you to our summer series. So this is our summer series preached by the associate pastors. We're starting a series that we've called Adventures in Faith Walking. Adventures in Faith Walking. This is a series, like all series that we preach here at Pioneer, it comes for a specific time on the calendar for a specific reason. And right now, we recognize that as a church, we are in the middle of transition. We're in the middle of transition between two leaders, and one of them, Pastor Shane, is coming in just a few weeks, 1st of July. We recognize that we as a church are in transition, but many of us as individuals are also in a period of transition. This is the summertime on an academic campus, and we know that summertime means transitions happen for students, for all those who are working, for families, transition is right now. We're sliding in between spring and summer, and for those that have allergies, you very well know the pollen is here, and transition is occurring. And so today, we are starting on a series that traces the life of Moses. We're tracing the life of Moses through all the major changes and upheaval that he went through from Egypt to the borders of the promised land. Moses spent an entire lifetime learning to walk by faith in the middle of uncertainty, in the middle of changes, in the middle of all these massive life, change, life changes. Moses had to learn to walk by faith. And so at the end of the series, we hope that you come away with a better understanding of what that looks like so that you can turn to your own life and say, I can trust in God as I step forward into the middle of change and uncertainty. Let's bow our heads. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather once again and hear a little bit about how you worked in the lives of people you loved. Lord, you're still the God that works in lives, and so we're asking that as we listen to the story, as we hear what you did, that everything again be you and only you. But we can take to heart that you can do the same thing for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Before I begin, I should also thank Dr. Scotty Baker, one of Andrew's own scholars and experts on the Exodus. We had an incredibly insightful conversation. He shared with me some wisdom from his gleanings on the, on the book. And much of the historical context and background shared today comes from that conversation. So thank you, Dr. Baker. When things don't go according to your plan. It's the title that we have today. When things don't go according to your plan. When things don't go according to your plan, I want you to take one sentence away from this sermon. If that's all you get, I want you to take one sentence away, and that is that your plans might have changed, but God hasn't. Nothing is wasted at the well. Your plans might have changed, but God hasn't, and nothing is wasted at the well. If that is the only thing you take away, good. Nothing is wasted at the well. We think about the life of Moses, and Moses began his life under dangerous times. He was born under the threat of death. And for three months, his Hebrew mom stepped out in faith and hid him away, defying Pharaoh's orders. But eventually, her maternity leave was up, and she, was, she would be forced to go back to work just like all the other Hebrews were. And so what she does is she, she places Moses in this Noah's Ark-like Hebrew basket, which was basically a, a, an ancient lunchbox, and stores him safely, strategically, in the Nile River. Strategically in the Nile River because she leaves him in a spot where she knows that the daughter of Pharaoh will go down to perform a fertility ritual at the Nile River. She leaves him there in the basket, and she steps away, and she leaves him and his fate up to God and his older sister, as I can only imagine. She says, I can't see what's about to happen. I don't know if this is going to work out the way I think it is. You stay here and just report back. Just nod your head yes or no. And so she leaves Moses there, and as Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the river, she comes down, performs the ritual, and she can only hear the crying of a baby in this basket. And she, so she goes over, drawn to the sound, looks in the basket, and picks Moses up. 
And right then and there, Moses' sister with lightning speed runs out and says, I have a plan. Mrs. Pharaoh's daughter, I can help you out. I know how we can make this work. And Pharaoh's daughter agrees to the plan. And so Moses' older sister convinces her to let Moses come back to the family for a couple more years, for a little bit longer. And so he does. But eventually, Moses has to go back to the palace. He has to go back to the palace, and he's there adopted by Pharaoh himself. And with Pharaoh adopted by Pharaoh, with Moses adopted by Pharaoh himself, he's no longer under the threat of death. But now he's heir to the biggest throne in the world. But he's still a Hebrew. He's a Hebrew living in the Egyptian courts, and so he has this dual identity with part of it bottled up, shoved deep down inside. He continues to grow up like an Egyptian. He's given an Egyptian name, honoring an Egyptian god. But the author of Hebrew, uh, the author of, uh, of the Hebrew author of Exodus wipes away the first part of that name, and all we're left with is Moses, which just means brought out from dot, dot, dot. He keeps his true identity hidden away because he's half Egyptian, but he's half Hebrew. But he feels a sense of solidarity. He feels a sense that his people are not being treated the way they should. And so he feels compelled to go and watch, to go and see what it would have been like if he hadn't been rescued in the basket. And that's where we we find him in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. Moses goes out. And in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way, looking that way, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he goes out and he sees two Hebrews fighting and he asks the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, Pharaoh tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Moses runs away. He runs away. He runs as fast as he can, and he goes to Midian, and he sits down by this well in the middle of the desert. And the last thing that Moses would have said was, this feels right. He would have said, this doesn't feel right. This feels, this feels wrong. Everything about this feels wrong. I'm here sitting by a, a well in the middle of the desert. My life leading up to this had been going one way, but somehow I ended up on this other course that I don't quite know how one thing led to another. But here I am, and everything I've ever known is gone. This was a moment of failure. It was a moment where Moses looked around at the pieces of his life and looked back and said, everything I've done was a miscalculation and a mistake. It was a mess. The years of bottled up angst seeing his family treated the way it was must have eaten away at him. And he was put in this position seemingly appointed by God to enact change. And then all of a sudden when he steps in to do something small, it all turns on him. It all turns on him. And then he has to run. He has to run from the Egyptian royal palace across the Sinai Desert to Midian for miles and miles away. And here, sitting beside a well, Moses was no longer second to Pharaoh. He was second to the sheep coming to get water. And he sat there reflecting on the mess of his life. And I can only imagine, I can only imagine uh, him growing up in Pharaoh's court, but being a Hebrew... I can only imagine the whispers that he heard, the whispers of liberator, deliverer, rescuing king, divinely appointed by God for this exact moment to help us. And all of that, all of that must have instilled a sense of purpose in Moses' heart. All of that, he must have felt that he was there for a reason, that that God had placed him there to do something big. All of that must have instilled a sense that God was leading his every step. But he was treated like the criminal he was when he tried to do something small. He was forced out 
of the plans that he had made for himself. He was forced out of everything that he thought would work. And so he sat by a well in Midian. And I think, I think that there's some of you in the congregation today that are sitting by your own wells. Just like Moses was thousands of years ago, you sit by your own well. You let the tears and the heartache pour out as you sit by your own well. Your well might be a very public well. You might have a very public well like when your spouse blindsides you with paperwork that says they don't, they don't love you anymore and they want to leave. Or your well might be public and shameful. The moments that you're pushed out of your community because of a few moments of indiscretion. You might have mixed wells. It's a, it might be a mixed well. That time that you get the phone call with the bad diagnosis from your doctor, the same week that they patted your back and off into retirement. There are other wells that you have. There are the private wells. The private wells where you get the third, fourth, and 14th rejection letter for that job that you know you are qualified for. There are also traumatizing wells where you get the phone call that another loved one has passed away, that you've had another miscarriage, that someone else has turned their back on you. There are those traumatizing wells, and then there are helpless wells. The helpless wells for when the business is going bad, the sales are down, it's not your fault, but there's nothing you can do but pick up the calls as the creditors ask for their money. There are helpless wells, but there's also uncertain wells. Uncertain wells are the ones that you look down into the murky, deep, dark waters swirling around, and you don't see any future, any direction, any plan, or any purpose, but everyone else seems to have their life all together. Yeah, we all have our own well, and we're all going to come to our own well at some point in our lives. They can be joyful, they can be awful, or they can be both at the same time. These are wells that we sit by in the middle of massive change. And we sit by these wells during uncertainty with the baggage of every plan we ever purposed, every hope we ever held, every dream we ever desired, every craving we ever cradled, every mountain or molehill that never moved. We sit there with every anxiety that ever attacked, every mistake we ever made. We sit there with all of these silently judging us for every action we ever made, and we sit there thinking that our old life that we had just isn't coming back. We all come to our own arid, windswept, dry, dusty wells at some point. We all do. And these wells, they become changing points. They become points of distinction in our life. These points of distinction change everything about our life, and those changes change us. It's almost like that well is, a, is the period at the end of a sentence, where the first half of the sentence is cut off, never to be edited again. That part of your life is gone and pushed to the side, and the next one has begun. There's a space, and you can't ever go back to that. And as you sit there by your own personal well, I wonder what your posture is like. What's your posture at the well? What what position do you take by the well? What emotions do you express by the well? Are you the one that wallows by the well, bemoaning all that never will be again? Are you the one who is angry at the well, lashing out at all the other people sitting at their wells? Or are you empty and silent at the well, watching life engage on the outside while you're not part of it? Are you the person that is negotiating at the well, trying to get a fraction of their life back, saying, if I can only get something back, that would be enough? Or maybe you're the one that simply disbelieves, saying, if I only woke up from this nightmare, it will all be over. And I think that all of those postures, all of those positions at the well, have a place in the lament process. All of those have a place somewhere in the lament process. But I think that there might be another posture that's just a little bit more helpful for the long term. Another posture that just might give you a slight, slight edge for the long term. And that posture, that posture is, are you sitting at the well watching in wonder? 
Are you sitting at the well watching in wonder for who or what God will place in your path? Are you sitting at the well watching and waiting for God to do something? Because God will always do something. And I, I bet that he put somebody or something in your path. Because that's what happened to Moses. In the middle of wallowing and wandering, Moses sits down at his well exhausted. <clears throat> Think about this. He had just run from one nation to another under the threat of death. He'd run across a desert. He'd spent hours, days on the, on the run alone. And here he is, finally at a place that he can sit, exhausted. But he's there and he starts watching. He starts watching all the other well gatherers go about their life, doing their thing, and there he is alone beside it. But then all of a sudden, off towards the distance, his eyes catch something happening. There's movement off to the distance. There's a group of male shepherds harassing a group of seven female shepherds. <coughs> and there Moses is, and he sees this happen, and his fight or flight instinct kicks in. The amygdala in his brain kicks in. The adrenal glands start pumping adrenaline. The cortisol levels come up to increase his focus. His muscles become hypertense. He becomes hyper aware, alert of everything that's happening. Suddenly, the man who is purposeless has a purpose. And so he stands up. He stands up and he jumps up, ready to intervene. The text tells us, Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs with water to water their, their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up. And he came to their rescue and watered their flock. Moses intervenes. He jumps up. He combats the shepherds, and he stands in the gap preventing what could have been awful. The deliverer once again stands for somebody that needs help. But then the shepherds go away, and the deliverer becomes the helper. The helper draws the water out, and I'm, I don't know how many sheep were there, but I can only imagine it was a big deal. So he draws the water out, and he gives water to the sheep. They say their pleasantries, they say their thanks, and then the helper goes away. The girls go back to their, their home, and Moses is back to being purposeless, sitting by a well. But the girls go back to their father. Their father asks, how are you back so soon? And they tell the story, and in the story they say, they, an Egyptian came and rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And then verse 20, where is he, Ruel asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. So Moses comes and he agrees to stay, he stays with the man, who, and he, the man gives him his daughter Zipporah in marriage. And then verse 22, it says, Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Moses, Ruel, the seven daughters. Most people know Ruel as Jethro. Jethro is the wise father-in-law in the story of the Exodus that helps Moses later on in life divide up the, nation, the, the Hebrew people into the nation of Israel. He gives counsel as a mentor and a guide for Moses throughout his life and his leadership. But right now, the, the, the author of the text doesn't use the, the name Jethro. Instead, he uses the name Ruel. And Ruel is most likely a family clan name here, a title, if you will. And the title Ruel means friend of God. Now, I think it's a subtle reminder that you never know who will come across your way when you are sitting at your well. You never know who you will meet in connection with your well experience. You never know where one of God's friends will end up when you need them most. Because of all the wells in all the world, Moses ended up at the one well that God's friend came to. And there, God's friend invited him in. I suggest to you today that if you decide to watch in wonder beside your own personal well, you will be surprised at who shows up. You'll be surprised at where a friend of God pops up in the place you least expect it. You'll be surprised because God has friends everywhere. 
God has friends in the lowest of the low places waiting to come into your orbit to talk to you. The truth is that you might not be ready to talk to God himself, but God will send one of his friends to prepare the way. But if you spend all your time wallowing at the well, you just might miss the mentorship, the support, the community that God has provided and is just waiting for you to take advantage of. So instead of wallowing at the well, maybe a better posture is to watch and wonder for what God's going to do. Watch and wonder. When Moses showed up at the well, God took him at his most worthless and reminded him that he was worthwhile. Even for a few moments, he had a purpose again as the deliverer. God was reminding Moses each and every step of the way that when I look at you, I see somebody with purpose. God took one look at Moses at the well and said, yo, boy. (laughs) I'm no Dwight Nelson. And that's the last time I'll do it. One of, our, one of our elderly saints in first service, after I did that, uh, she, she shouted out, just not the same. <laughs> and I agree. <clears throat> but we miss you, Dwight. And we hope you're doing well in retirement. Same to you, Karen. God took one look at Moses at the well. And he said, you don't know me very well, Moses. You don't know me at all. You spent a, a, a lifetime in the Egyptian palace. You don't know me at all, but I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting for this moment because the the ring of Egyptian power is no longer in your ears. Finally, there's a moment where you can hear my soft, subtle voice. And then God shouted out across the entire universe for everyone to hear. And he said, Moses, at one point you were drawn out from the Nile and called a child of Pharaoh, but now I'm drawing you out from this well experience and calling you my child. And God is in the same business of shouting out across the universe today for you and for me. God's still in the business of saying, I'm drawing you out to call you to myself. He says, I'm drawing you out of the hardest moments of your life to call you to myself. I'm drawing you out of the despair to call you to myself. He says, I'm drawing you out of the chaos and the confusion and the trouble and the difficulty and the change to call you to myself. Because he says, I created you. I redeemed you, I love you, and I'm calling you out to myself. He says, I'm drawing you out. I'm drawing you out for me. And the the theologian Augustine, I think, felt that drawing out by God when he penned the words that you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless till we find rest in you. God is calling you out. He's drawing you out of your own well experience and calling you to himself. And he's going to remind you that you are still his child. No matter what's happened in your life, you are still a child of God. No matter what the first part of your life looked like, no matter what the change looks like, you're still a child of God. And he has a purpose for you. And the beauty is, is that he'll remind you you're a child by taking your well experience and repurposing it for your next steps in life. Because he wants to remind you that although your plans have changed, he hasn't. And nothing is wasted at the well. This wasn't the last time that Moses would come to this well here in Midian. No, he takes, he takes on the, the family name. He takes on the family job. He, he follows up with the family business, and he brings his sheep to this well day in and day out. And this well that was a symbol of all the heartache and everything that he had left behind in Egypt suddenly becomes the one source of sustaining life in the middle of a desert. He comes to his well almost daily to give life to his new purpose, his sheep. God took the well that was the the symbol of heartache and repurposed it to be the life-sustaining, the life-sustaining fuel for his new purpose. (coughs) For the purpose-driven go-getter, that must have been torture. Being in the middle of the Midian desert. 
But slowly but surely, you have to wonder, did he start realizing that he had a new purpose? That God was taking something old and repurposing it for something new and beautiful? I wonder. I wonder. What I can tell you today is that when you come to your own well, when you come to your own well of whatever personal heartache or difficulty or change that you're facing, when you ever come to that well, nothing is lost there. Some people feel like the time, that they had, the time that they had spent in their first part of their life, the energy and the effort they had spent to build things up only to have that taken away was worthless. But God's saying nothing is lost at the well. Nothing is lost. All your past is not lost at the well because God can take that and repurpose it into something new and beautiful. And I think about the story of Ken Oliver. Ken Oliver got out of jail at the age of 52. He had spent the last 23 years in prison for theft. Of those 23 years, he spent eight years in solitary confinement for possessing a book that you can easily get at the Andrews University or Berrien Springs Public Library. Eight years in solitary confinement by himself would have driven most people insane. But in an interview, he says, the thing that kept him and his mind fresh was reading everything he could. He picked up every book that he was allowed to have, and he read it from art to history, to politics, to literature, <clears throat> to other languages, to even picking up the state penal code and memorizing it so that he had a better command of the law than most lawyers do. Slowly, the time ticked by, year after year after year, until one day, one day, a corporate lawyer somehow heard of Ken Oliver's case, and he ran back to his firm and convinced them, we need to take this on for free. We need to do this. They said yes, so the lawyer came back. Ken Oliver said yes, and so they carefully crafted their appeal, word by word, making sure that each word meant what they said it would, that each precedent that they were citing actually would do the job of making the argument, and they sent in their appeal to the state, and then they waited. They waited and kept waiting. Would the appeal even be heard? <clears throat> would the appeal come back with a positive, positive motion? Like, will, will we be able to take this someplace? And finally, finally the result came in the form of a settlement offer. Mr. Ken Oliver, fearful for how long the trial might go, said, I'll take it. My freedom and $125,000 for my trouble get me out of here. And even though the money would not repay a fraction of the, of the difficulty experienced, he recognized that his experience could be the catalyst to repurpose his own well. It was the training ground for a life's work that has begun and he has saved thousands from similar experiences since. And this has happened in the four years since he has left prison. Mr. Ken Oliver has become a philanthropist. He's become a public policy director. He spent hours in front of state legislatures arguing for prison reform, for recidivism reduction, and opportunities for those that wouldn't have them otherwise. Since leaving prison, Mr. Ken Oliver has recognized that the source of his most difficult trials could be repurposed to be the fuel for his new purpose. And I think that that story and what Patriarchs and Prophets has to say about Moses gives a great reminder. Many would have dispensed with that long period of toil and obscurity, deeming it a great loss of time. But infinite wisdom called him who was to become the leader of his people to spend 40 years in the humble work of a shepherd. The habits of caretaking, of self-forgetfulness, and tender solicitude for his flock thus developed would prepare him to become the compassionate, long-suffering shepherd of Israel. No advantage that human training or culture could bestow could be a substitute for this experience. Moses had to recognize that growth was not linear. It wasn't a straight line shot from zero to 100 success. Moses had to learn that growth is not a straight line. 
It's a modern lie that tells us that we're supposed to get better, fitter, faster, more attractive every year. It's a lie that says once we feel ready, we're, we're ready to succeed. Because growth isn't a straight line. Our life has setbacks. Our life has challenges. And there's times where we are set back because we have to unlearn before we can learn and grow. The thing about setbacks, though, is that God takes setbacks and can make them his greatest victory. God can take the, the, the difficulties and the pit stops and make them the places where you learn and grow so that God can be victorious in ways you would have never seen before. If you're in the middle of your desert, sitting by your own well day in and day out, Maybe it's time to stop and think about how God is using that well experience for the next stages of your life, for the next little bit of purpose, the next plan that he has, how God is going to take that setback and launch you forward with the things that you've learned. Because spiritual growth isn't a straight line. Your relational growth isn't a straight line. Your emotional, healthy growth isn't a straight line. You have setbacks, but you grow from those. And in the same way, God wants to take you and grow you and stretch you because the next step of the way, he's got something amazing planned just for you to accomplish that he can only do through you if you let him. And the truth is, the truth is, you have to let him. Every step of the way, you have to let him. You have to say yes. You have to say yes. Let me, let me be a part of this. Let me be a part of this. Whatever's happening, I don't know right now, but whatever's happening, let me, let me be a part, God. Whatever you have for me. I'll take it. I'll take it. Nothing is wasted at the well. Nothing is wasted at your personal well. Because the, the Bible is chocked full of stories that people only started living out their God-giving purpose later on in life. Because the, the, God's trying to teach everyone that he can do more with one or two years that you give him than an eternity of life that you have out, outside of him. It's why... Each month, you tithe. Because tithing is a reminder that God can do more with the 10% you give than the 90% you hold back. All God wants is the permission to take you and mold you and use you. And you can do incredible things with just the little bit that you give. Imagine what you can, what you can do with the all of you that you give. When you lean in to his purpose and his plan. When you lean into what he's doing, imagine what he could do with all of you. Imagine the life that could be lived. Imagine the victories won and for him. Because he wants to take your setbacks and make them success. For him and his kingdom. So nothing, no, nothing is wasted at the well. Nothing is wasted at the well. As we wrap up today, it's important to acknowledge just how gut-wrenching it can be to have your plans and your future changed. When you've set your entire life up in one direction, only to have that cut down at the knees, only to have your identity taken away from you, that is gut-wrenching. And it's important to acknowledge just how gut-wrenching it is when your plans have changed. But your plans, they might have changed. But no matter what our plans look like, you and I can take heart. You and I can take heart because no matter how much our plans have changed, God hasn't. God hasn't changed. The often quoted Jeremiah 29 11 tells us that he has better plans. He has plans that he thinks towards for us that are better plans, that have a future and a hope. They're better than anything you and I could ever come up with. And so the plans that we have to say, those are in the past now, well, God can repurpose all that, all that experience and that life for something beautiful, for a plan that you and I can't even imagine. He's just waiting to work it out for you. Because God can still bring victory from tragedy. He can still create a purpose and a plan when you feel pointless. And if God can do that for Moses, what can he do for you? Your plans have changed. God hasn't. Nothing is lost at the well. Nothing is lost. Your journey, though, might be frustratingly slow. It might have detours and pit stops. It might have repeated trips back to your well as you learn, unlearn, and relearn. But nothing is lost during your well experience, no matter how long you have to wait. 
As we're wrapping up, I'm going to call the, the praise team up behind me. No matter how long you have to wait, God is still working with you. God is still calling you out, drawing you out and calling you to himself for the promised hope and a better future. And he says that one day, one day things are going to take off. You just wait for it. The purpose he has for you will be accomplished. So I say, your plans have changed. God hasn't. Nothing is lost at the well. So wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Moses would spend 40 years in the desert leading sheep. After years and years of waiting, God would again call Moses. This time, God would call him at a burning bush to the next stage of life. But you'll have to wait till next week for that part of the story. Today, though, remember that your plans have changed. God hasn't. And nothing is lost at the well, so wait on the Lord. The song we're going to sing in just a second will be a reminder that we need to wait on the Lord and see what he's going to do. I'm going to wait on you, Lord. Are you going to wait? I hope so. And as we wait, let's watch and see what he will do. We pray that you have been blessed today as you have worshipped with us, that you have been encouraged and energized and refreshed for the rest of the journey, wherever it takes you. May the Lord go with you as you go. And remember that we were happy that you joined us for worship, that you will come again next time. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and always. Amen.